My name is Ingrid Honkla and at the time of my neither experience, I was living in Bogota, Colombia, where I grew up with my parents and my sisters. I was only two years old, near to three years old when the accident happened. Both of my parents had to work. They left us in the house at the care of a maid. She was a very, very young lady that really didn't pay much attention to the things we were doing when my parents were not around. As soon as my parents left, the maid just went to her room and decided just to go relax and listen to soap operas. I had two sisters at the time. My oldest sister was close to four, and the youngest one was just one year old. My oldest sister and I just decided, oh, let's go play in a patio that was at the back of the house. This is so clear in my mind that I remember even like seeing two balls there in the patio and we saw the balls decided, oh, let's play catch. We grabbed one of the balls and in a corner there was a big tank to collect water for hand washing clothes. So what we just decided was like, oh, let's play catch across the tank. This was a, a very high, big tank, so we found a couple of stools. My sister just went on top of the flat surface next to the tank, where she was a little safer, and I went to the other side. So this was a, a very thin edge, and what I did, I just bended my, my legs, and I just was leaning very precariously in this tank. But at two years old, I was going to think about any kind of danger, just thinking about having fun. So my sister, she threw the ball at me. And when she threw it, she was little. She didn't apply enough force for the ball to cross and it fell on the water. And I saw the ball close enough that I thought I can grab it. And when I leaned forward and tried to grab it, it rolled on the surface of the water and I fell. The first feeling I had when falling into this water was the intense feeling of being freezing cold. I was born in Bogota, which is high up in the Andes. And the temperature late at night and early in the morning can be between 30 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature in that water was very cold. The first feeling I had, like <gasps> this intense cold, and it was the feeling of my chest had imploded and I couldn't breathe. I could hear my sister even screaming and trying to get me from the surface, but there's nothing she could do. The last thing I could hear was my chest, my heart pumping in my head really loud. And at that moment is when something amazing happened. I went from this state of absolute horror to a state of absolute and complete peace. It was a state of serenity. There was just nothing to fight for anymore. It was just peace. I also experienced the state of absolute silence. So it was what I call the silence behind the silence. And another remarkable thing that gave a lot of contrast was that this tank was very dark because it was made of cement. So when I fell into this tank, I remember the last thing I saw was darkness. And right there, when the sense of calmness happened, there was a light. And there was a light that happened, it, it came from, from below. Ding. And now this light was illuminating my entire watery surrounding. Just like, oh. So I started to just look around and I saw bubbles suspended in the water and the bubbles were surrounded by light. And I started to chase these bubbles. And by chasing the bubbles was that I turned around and then I saw a body suspended in the water. And incredibly at that moment, I knew that that was my body. I was born as a very sick child. I was ill all the time. I had respiratory problems. I was always sick. And now I was in a state of absolute well-being. So when I saw the body in the water, I thought, I'm not going back to that. 
Why, why would I want to be there? Where I am sick, where I am not free, where I feel trapped. So my first thought was like, I'm leaving. I can leave this body behind. And as I was experiencing this state of being, in just a blink, I appear in the maid's room. Like if I was looking at her from above. And, oh, I just was seeing her lying on her bed. And the memory of this is so clear that I can even remember the soap opera that she was listening in the radio. And I just said, oh, that's Maria. But she was completely unaware of what was happening. So from there in again, just a second, I appear in my mom's path. And she was, like I said, on her way to work. She's left the house. It took about 10 minutes to go from the house to her bus stop. At the time, she didn't have a car, so she had to walk. And that's what happened. I just appeared on her path. And when I saw her from above, again, like, like with the maid, I just said, oh, that's mom. And at that precise moment, she felt that something was happening at home. It's like I could sense her thinking. She stopped and she thought something is happening with one of my babies. She turned around and started to run back home. I just looked at her, but at the same time, I got distracted by the realization that wherever I put my mind, I could go. So if like, whoa, if I put my mind at the end of the street, I will be there. If I would just uh, see a, a, an animal, whatever it was, I would be there. So for me, time and space vanished and I could be anywhere at any time. There was not limitations of anything. You could actually feel and know everything happening with everybody. And in, again, just a flash, I appeared in a realm that was made of absolute, pure, bright light. And this is what makes this extremely hard to forget, and is that for the first time in, the, in these three years of my life, I felt that I was home. So it was the sense of like, oh, I'm finally home. Actually, this experience was more real than this reality. And I felt that I was being welcome. At that moment is when the sense of self started to dissolve. And I started to become one with the whole. Beyond this, I experienced what I say to people is the, the sense of non-self or the sense of nothingness. There's no sound, there's no color, there's no movement, there's no meaning, there's no description. At this point, there was not even thought. It's, it's like all that was gone. You just complete a state of oneness. I became existence itself. And while I was experiencing this state of being, my mom, finally made a home and she knew exactly where to go. She uh, directed herself to the back of the house. Right there in like in this flat surface, she found my sister. My mom just went into the town, got me out and she said that I was just like a raggedy doll. My lips were blue, I was completely white. There was no really life, in, there was no life in this body. I was so detached from this reality that I was not concerned with this at all. This was already gone. My mom, like everything in life is, is designed perfectly for the purpose that we're coming here to do. So the purpose of my mom at that moment was to get me out of this tank and save me. So incredibly, she was trained CPR because she worked with children. Otherwise she would not have known what to do. And she got me out of the water. She did what she had to do to revive me. Again, like everything happened in this experience in just a flash, I felt that I had jumped from the tallest building in the world. 
I felt the sense of being vacuumed back. Like if you just jump from, from an airplane, from a building, and it's this vacuum feeling like, and I was being pulled and there was nothing I could do to stop this. And I knew I was back because all the feelings of discomfort, coldness and sickness and the lack of freedom was back. And I was not very happy <laughs> to be back. So that was the beginning of things becoming really hard for us. And I started to get sicker than before. I refused to eat and I would just go to the mirror, look at myself and I scream to my mom and say, you don't understand, this is not me. This is not my name and I should not be here. I'm not this child. This is just the state of my body, but I am not a child. I had an awareness that I did not have before. When I looked at my parents, I realized that they were not just my parents. I felt them as my equal. And I also came back with abilities that I didn't have before. No long after, I could read and I could write and I could resolve mathematical problems and I could put together complex puzzles. So and it, it was something people around me, my mom, they were in disbelief with what was happening with this child. And I couldn't relate with other children because to me it was like, they don't know anything. What is going on with these people? And at the time, there was not like today, internet or the TV or, or the books or any materials that could bring them to understand what was happening. There was not really any knowledge about near their experiences in Colombia. People didn't know any of this. And Colombia was a country at war. So my parents were more concerned how we, we survive and live the day to day life. They kind of continue living life and say, oh, we hope she will get better. And actually, yes, it happened. Because when, when things went really, really hard and I was in, in, in the worst of, of the moments, the help that I needed came in the most remarkable way. In the sense that I was being taken to the realm of the light during my sleep. At the time, I didn't know that I was having out-of-body experiences. And although all that was kind of disturbing, I wanted it to happen because it was bringing me to that realm of the light. Then I guess at the time, the only thing I enjoyed really doing was going to sleep. And in one of these journeys, one day I was completely surrounded by starlight figures that were shining in all different colors. And I was like, wow, there's a being of light. And now they are here. It approached me and then it touched me. And at that moment I said, oh, you are a being of light. By being in their presence and feeling that, that state of, oh, of home that I was experiencing in, in that realm of the light made me feel so well that I started to heal. I started to eat and I started to communicate with everyone again and, and I just started to feel joyful and happy and although they didn't know or do anything, the sense of love was such that nothing else was needed. And that was the teaching I got from the very beginning, everything is going to be okay. And although I couldn't understand that many times, how this can be okay. <laughs> That was always the teaching. Everything is happening for a reason and everything is following a path of perfection. We just don't know this because we're just living and understanding a very little piece of the picture. We don't know what anything is for. And later in my life, I learned that the purpose of this was the beings of light wanted to show me that home was not a place. Home was a state of being. Home, heaven is here and now. Although I was already feeling better and starting to just feel like I could communicate and sense more well being, I was very detached to my persona. So I would look at myself and I will 
like listen to my name and say this this is not my name and there was an occasion in we now we had a, a new maid in the house and she was calling me for dinner and I wouldn't come and she approached me and he said I am calling you Ingrid I'm calling you for dinner and I said don't call me like that that is not my name and she just said so what is your name how should I call you and I said I do not need one that night they sent me to bed like oh we had enough of you and that was the first time the beings of light talked to me they said to me it is going to take time for them to understand she's like wow there was now not just presence but they also sound i'm like oh to understand what and they said to understand that in the realm of the light, names are not needed, as you already know. So it's like the, this kind of communication where there's sound that is not the same kind of sound we hear here. There's no female, there's no male. I don't think we're actually hearing with our ears. It's like the inner ears, but it's very clear. Another thing the beings of light said to me when they started to talk first with me was that I had to remain quiet because they were not going to understand. And I would be like, what do you mean they're not going to understand? This was my state of reality. So I'm like, what, what is not to understand? And but yeah, really, really soon, I realized what they were saying. I was born in a country where 98% of the population was Catholic and they were completely close to anything. It was a point where I went to talk to our priest and he said, you have to sit there and pray because this is the devil talking to you. This was another thing. When I came back, like I said, I had abilities. For me, it was very easy because I didn't have to learn anything. I was just remembering. So at school, I will go and I know this and I know, oh, I know that. And the teacher will be like, if you know everything, you sit in that corner and let us be. So in every sense, I was ostracized. I realized I cannot show these abilities. I cannot talk about these things. And it kept happening through time, but the beings of light also said to me, you will never be alone. And people is going to appear in your path to help you. People are going to be there to guide you as we will be guiding you too. And it was around five years old when I went to kindergarten that my mom actually discovered that for real, I was seeing something. Because before it was like, oh yeah, maybe she, you know, the kids, you always see children, I'm like, yeah, she's, they're imagining things. We don't take them serious. But when I went to school and I started to draw everything with auras, and everything I was drawing was every, and even in my notebooks, in, <laughs> everywhere I was painting starlight figures. The teacher came and she's like, what is this here? Are these the sun and the stars? And I said, no, those are my friends, the beings of light. I'm seeing these things. And I told my mom, mom, these are the colors that we wear. And these are my friends, the beings of light. I wanted somebody to believe me. And my mom looked at me with these mom eyes like, don't say a word. And then we left that day, the school and on the way home, we were sitting in the bus and she looked at me and she said, I believe you. I also see things that nobody see. So it's when she revealed to me that she could see spirits and she has been seeing a spirit since she was five years old. But just like me, she had learned to remain quiet because it was not safe to talk about that. There was a time in my life when I would ask them, what can I do or say to these people that don't believe? They said to me something really beautiful. They said to me, do or say nothing. The light of your awareness is all they need. That is not the things we, we go saying, it's the way we are, it's who we are. Be the light, be that awareness, and with that you're doing the work. And that's what I did. The time to talk will come. So, of course, there was still this discordance, you know, I was trying to live a life at a school, but I was always different, so never had many friends, was always kind of bullied and ostracized. My oldest sister became my protector. 
wherever we were, she's like protecting me from anybody that was trying to harm me. And when I went to college, things went even harder for me because now I had sisters that were very beautiful. Boys were coming to, into our lives now. It was all this time where the, everybody's hormones is at their peaks and I was so different. I didn't feel what anybody felt. And I was like, I, yeah, I want to be like you guys. I, I want to be normal. I don't want to be this person. I don't want to be different. And that started to come really hard on me. I don't want to be different. So at that time of my life, I could not really appreciate my uniqueness. I reached the point where now my uniqueness was a burden. So I joined college and I, it's when I told the beings of light, I want to be like everyone else. And at the same time, there was situations were very hard at home. My parents were at the verge of divorcing. Things were going hard at home. It's like when all the challenges come together. I guess this is the moment where these two very deep questions knock the door of my life. I ask, when did we stop being one with the whole? And how is it possible to forget who we truly are? I kept asking the beings of life, why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when they answered to me, in 20 years you will understand. What? 20 years, imagine, and even at that age, 20 years is like a forever and a day. And they say someday you will pass these teachings to others. No, at that moment of my life, I was not interested. I want to become a scientist, I'm not interested. I'm not teaching this to anyone. I asked the beings of light just to give me a break, pretty much. I wanted to be like everyone else. And this is the compassion of the universe. We're not forced. I mean, at that moment, it was like, okay, you're not going to see us or hear us for a while. When you are ready, it will happen. I needed to ground. So I needed to choose a career and I needed to choose things that would ground me in this world. Because up to that moment, I felt like I was a helium balloon. I was floating in another, I was not here. Now, I needed an anchor to bring me down. I decided that I wanted to become a marine scientist. When I was four, my parents took me to see the ocean for the first time. And when I saw the ocean, I turned to my mom and said, someday I'm going to know what is under that blanket. I developed this love for the water. Now I wanted to know the depthness of everything. So now I put my dial in a different frequency and the communication now was cut. And I say to people, it's like when you're in a room that is full of furniture, like here now there's furniture everywhere, but if the light is on, get what, you don't trip. You know where to go. I know where the door is. I know where everything is. But what happens when you turn off the light? Now all the things in the room become obstacles. Everything becomes a challenge. But what is the purpose of those challenges? To bring you back to turn on that light for yourself. So all this is put in our path for us to go back through our own experience, through our own perception, to the state of knowing, to the state of, oh, I am. I am now remembering who I truly am. So that's why the human experience is one of the, the most amazing ones, because it brings so much contrast that we can see the other side. So for me, I turn off the light in the room and now 20 years of challenges. Once you lose your authentic self, once you become so separated to who you truly are, you're lost. So through those years, time for me, I started to, to worry about things I never worried before. And, and money become a problem and 
not having the right friends become a problem and not having the right boy. I met abusive people and my job brought me to live in a war zone. I saw the extremes of poverty. I saw people were being massacred and we used to do drills all the time because we could be attacked at any moment. The very first day I arrived to this place, there was a, a shooting outside the base and now I was experiencing the war. It was a really, really hard reality. So I had a boss that was on top of living in this area. He was really strict and nothing was okay. And this area was also known for tsunami, natural disasters. So I was just like, okay, what else? I used to go to, to the field to collect samples and I had to go with two guys full armed with M16s to be safe. And at this point, like rebels were dropping bombs everywhere. It was a disaster. So it's when one of my coworkers one evening said, I'm going to go out of this base because I'm not going to remain here, but because we were scientists working with the government, we were military targets and we were told not to leave the base. So when these guys say, we're not, I am not a prisoner here, he left that evening and he got killed. Now I met who is my husband today and he was with the Navy. He said, you have to come to the United States. Things are getting really hard there. You're going to get killed. But it was hard to leave this job because in Colombia, only 4% of the budget goes to science. And for me to get this job and this good position, I was the chief of the Marine Biology and Ecology Department. I had a really good job. So it was like, I cannot leave this. I mean, I got this opportunity, how I can leave this job. But there's a moment in your life that you reach this point that none of this was anything. When your life, it's a peril. When now you realize that your happiness is gone. We came to the United States and only like three days after we married, somebody got hurt, they needed him to travel. He left for seven months and left me alone in the United States and didn't know anybody when I realized I'm lost in this world. And I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So like, it's like one challenge followed the other. And after that, uh, he was a special forces in the Navy, and he kept traveling. And although I kept meeting other dreams that were incredible, I, I got the opportunity to do my PhD, to work with NASA, I had my baby. At the same time, it was facing the fact that I was alone. My husband spent all his time traveling. My family was not in the US. I had to raise this child alone. He was a really sick baby when, when he was little. I had heart problems. So like one thing follow another, another. So I reached the point where I, I just was thinking why all this is happening in my life. It's been one hardship follow the other. And I even felt it since I was little because I couldn't understand when I was young why I, I came with all this awareness, why I was different. And now it was all these challenges. And one night I went to bed and I was just thinking, I had it, I had enough. The only thing keeping me alive at that moment of my life was my, my little baby. He was the light of my life at that moment and he was the one keeping me here. One night I was lying there next to my, my little one and, and this is things that brought me to feel so much empathy for the people that suffers because Sometimes people commit horrendous crimes, but we don't understand why, and we're just really quick to criticize or to judge. But I remember lying next to him and thinking, I love him so much that I cannot leave this world without him. And when I looked at him next, to him, just lying next to me, I thought, what if, what, why if, what if I take him with me? So it was a second of thinking something so horrible and I just at that moment I thought what am I thinking I lost it now I was lost and it's when I went back to pray again I went back to the complete and absolute desire to be connected with the light again I need some light 
and I pray like I had never prayed. I had to stop praying and meditating because I had made so many mistakes that I thought I wasn't worth it, of the being so light. And, and it was amazing because once this, I prayed, the answers came immediately. When I realized no one is judging me, I'm the only one judging myself. There's a point in your life that life shakes you so hard that you only have two choices. There's only two paths. The path of suffering or the path of the light. The path of suffering is, is like a cul-de-sac. You go to the end of this and there's nowhere to go. Or it's like when you're in a car and you turn it on, you press the gas, but you never put the drive, put the car in drive, you don't go anywhere. You're spending all your gas. You're spending all your energy, you're circling there, nothing is happening until you realize I had enough of this. Some people have to get sick, somebody has to die. You, you feel that you're going to just kill yourself, whatever it is, it brings you and shakes you so hard that you are forced to stop. And it's when you ask the question, what is this for? What am I doing here? Now the important questions start coming. And it's when the answers also start appearing. It's when you say, at that point when sometimes I, I am just so trapped in things I don't understand, I said, God help me see because I cannot see. But I know that behind this challenge, there is a teaching, there is a purpose. And the very next day I got, I woke up with the answer I needed. And I said to people, sometimes they are the most simple answers. The answer was, yeah, you need help. Go look for a psychologist. Yeah. And I had it clear. It was not just as, oh, I may do it. No, it was clear. I went this morning to my office. I looked for a psychologist. I phoned a guy in the web and it was the right person. So I went to talk to him and it's when we realized that sometimes what we truly need is just to be listened. And this person was opening to listen. This guy is not judging me. And that was the opening for me. I was the one that said to him, why me again? This question that always was resurfing, resurfing and why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when I got the most amazing answer. And he said, why not? For me, this was like the switch I needed at that moment. The light I turned off was on now. Because at that moment, he started to also say, look, thanks to this, you have done this. Thanks to this, you have done that. Thanks to this and this. And, and I was able to connect all the knots. And now it's like all my neurons, everything was like accelerating and everything was connecting. And this was the first time in my life I put myself at the cause of everything and not at the effect. And I started to see purpose in absolutely everything. At that moment, I also realized that none of that had happened was here anymore. It was in my mind and I could decide what to do with it. Wow, I can grab all this and just make a decision to start fresh. The true feelings of, of, of sense of forgiveness happen. It was the realization that there was nothing to forgive because nothing had ever been done to me to hurt me. It's been done for me to bring me to wake up. So this was one of my very first big awakenings. Now I was in the absolute knowing that source or the creator or God or ultimate reality, however we want to call it, was the essence of absolutely everything. Everything was it. And at that moment is when I realized that 20 years had passed, as they had said, because the two questions I asked 20 years before were answered. How we stop being one? When did we stop being one? And how is it even possible to forget who we truly are? 
And the answer came, like, again, no time. Not 20 years had passed. And the answer was, one never stopped being one. One never left the source. One just became distracted and seemingly forgot. So what is the purpose of time? And they say the purpose of time and experience is to help you remember who you truly are, is to bring you back to source. So it's when my life just completely turned upside down and, and my book started to happen. And it's when I was able to finally start opening and becoming that teacher they told me I was going to be. So it just needed all these years of preparation to to be where I am today and to be able to open up. And like they said, the time to talk will come. But another important thing and, and something I learned through all these years was also to remain humble. Because the beings of life said to me, you're not here to convince anyone of anything. Your path is the path of gentleness. And that's how we have to be because otherwise we start another war. I am right, you're wrong. No, how we actually listen to each other, how we actually share that love and, and share that connection. And it's when I also started to ask the right questions. The being so light said to me, in the right question reside the right answer. And that's how through my whole childhood and, and, and young years and through my life, when I was able to study all the teachings I studied, there was a point that I was learning things from Hinduism, Buddhism, teachings of Kabbalah, Vedanta, Christianity, Indian cultures of the Americas. And by the age of 16, I already knew that the core of all teachings was the same. And it was unconditional, pure love. And that we were confused with all the rituals and we stay in the outside and knowing what was important the core of things, love and unity. If you follow the path of love, you are in the right path. Look how the world, how we can say that things are going better for someone, the world is in such disaster. And people come to me with the feeling of disempowerment and I, they say, what can I do? I'm just one person. I, look at the world, what all these teachings can do for the world. And I said, you can do everything or you can do nothing. It all depends. You can do nothing if you see the problems of the world as a whole. So I put the example of a house. Say that, that you have a big castle and the castle is in absolute mess. Every room, everything in this house, in this castle is just disorganized. There was a huge party, a mess, a disaster. The moment that you think that you can clean all this house in one morning, in one minute, in one moment, the feeling of overwhelming is such that you will become disempowered. What can you do? Nothing. So you cannot see the problems of the world as a whole because then you disempower yourself. But the moment you think, oh, what if I start room by room? What if I start by cleaning up the kitchen? What if I cannot even do the whole kitchen? What if I start by the table? And little by little, the moment you organize this space and you pat yourself on the shoulder, oh, I did this. So now you're putting that, that you're learning in practice. You're empowering yourself. I can do something. Peace starts with each one of us. The moment we expect that others do it, the moment I look outside and say, look at the mess outside, I cannot do anything, I lost the battle. At the moment I say, I am this being capable of loving, capable of giving, then now I am becoming that light. And each one of us can be the light in the path of each other. I am not a light that is going to work alone because one light is easy to be blown away by the wind. But what if I start joining like we're doing here? 
another person that already discovered I have that inner light. I have that inner power and all these lights start joining and now we become a huge flame. And this is actually happening in this moment in the world. Although there's still a lot of chaos out, out there, there's a lot of people waking up right now. A lot of people that have been shaking so hard, but all these challenges and all these hardships that we're starting to realize what can we actually do? What can I do myself? In the end, I would say perception is projection. <laughs> so, so we're perceiving what we project. If I am a person that is at uh, uh, that state of anger and fear, and I see life with the eyes of hardship, that's what I'm getting back. If I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm frowning, I cannot expect the mirror to be doing anything else. When people try to change things at the level of the form, I said to them, you're wasting your time. This is already a result. You cannot change anything here. You have to go at the level of the cause. You have to go within. You have to see things with the eyes of wisdom. What is this for? What is the purpose of this? How can I do to be the light in this situation? I am the change that the world needs. It has to start from me. There's nothing outside. Why are you here? What is your purpose? Why are you presenting in my life? So we start practicing awareness in our life. I said awareness is the key to freedom. We become so trapped in our thinking that we cannot see anything that is just working for us and all the synchronicities and things that are happening for us and evolving in front of our eyes. We cannot see it because the moment we catch something, ooh, we missed already a lot. There was a time where the beings of light said to me, you think that you're thinking? You're never thinking. And I said, what? I think, I think all the time. And, and they said, no. People think they're thinking, but what they're doing is just trapping memories. You live your life trapping your own memories. That's why when children are, are, are just learning, it's like, oh, everything is new, everything is cool, everything is magic. But guess what? As we grow up, it's all the same, all the same. So the only time you're truly thinking is when you're connected with the creative thinking of the universe. And this only can happen when you are at the state of no thought or the state of presence. Now we're leaving our mind open as a channel. The answers to a problem didn't happen when we were stuck in it. It cannot be. Because what happened, you're feeding yourself from memories. You're always going to go back to the same. And the answer comes is when like, we are out there in the park or oh, relaxing, I forgot everything about it. At that moment, you heard the birds, you were in a state of contemplation. At that moment, you connected. And it's when the true answer comes. I do some practice. I, I, one of my favorite, favorite practices now is I do walking meditation. I go in this road, I even close my eyes and I, and I walk in the state of absolute awareness. I hear every bird, every leaf. I can sense the wind. I can hear every cricket. I hear my steps. So when you're going to be able to breathe right now, wherever you are, you are in the state of presence. And now we start perceiving and seeing things with the eyes of clarity. Everything has a purpose and even, even the, the religions and everything, the philosophies, everything that the, the humanity has gone through was needed at some point. Because those are all the little tools. Everything is, is a process. Like when we go to school, we don't start in college. We start in kindergarten. And from there we go. But the problem is when we get stuck in the same class, what if I repeat? first grade for the next 30 years, so there's no revolution anymore. Now we're stuck in the same. And that's what happened with a lot of, of the concepts, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the beliefs, is just being stuck in the same. 
only now that people are starting to ask the questions, because these questions have been formulated throughout the history of humanity, but just by few. Who am I? What is my purpose? Is this all it is? What if there's more? When we start asking these questions, we start evolving, seeking for something new. And all of us that have all these experiences are being able to talk because now I know that that person had it and that person, oh, now people start being feeling safe, safer to talk. And there's more, more conferences and more groups and more people that are coming outside the box and knowing that there's more, there's more and feeling that I want to talk. But sometimes before the big awakening, there's also an even bigger challenge. Before you wake up, there's the alarm clock or there's somebody shaking you awake. So that's sometimes what is needed and the world is now facing that, that point in which there's a lot going on. But that's just kind of like the earthquake that is needed for people to go to this realization, I had enough, I had enough of this. It's when we move out of the couch. I, I, I put the example of a bird that is in a nest, then life will push you so hard that now you make the decision, I better jump. And the moment you jump and spread the wings, now you realize, oh, I can fly. So if all these challenges didn't happen, you never knew that you could actually fly. <laughs>